thank you very much. Um, I don't know why Jim Silconet wouldn't want to come to Columbia, South Carolina today. I mean, the skies are blue, the temperature is about 20 degrees warm, and it's a cold day here. So uh, it's a, it was a great gift for us to offer for Jim to come and, and uh, be with us at this symposium. Uh, it's always a treat to be back at the law school. Uh, this is where I went to law school, as Lyle indicated. Uh, my memories of it, um, well, they're mixed sometimes. Um, I'll never forget some of the hard questions, the Socratic method, but uh, it's a wonderful law school, and it's a, it's a testament to this law school and the legal education. And so many South Carolinians have come from this law school and gone on to so many positions of leadership uh, in the nation. Uh, Ed Mullins in the back, the president of the Defense Research Institute, along with Steve Marson and David Dukes. Ken Suggs was president of ATLA. Uh, currently, uh, Chief, Chief Justice Jean Toll has been uh, president of the Conference of Chief Justices. Uh, Judge Traxler of the Fourth Circuit is now chair of the Executive Committee of the United States Judicial Conference. You can just go on and on and on. The number of people who have come out of this law school who have made a name for themselves and the state of South Carolina and this law school. And so you should be proud to be here. And don't buy into all the gloom and, and uh, all the negative reports uh, you hear about the future of, of the profession. Uh, just this week, I was at a meeting in Georgia, and there were, we were there with uh, a number of people from the Supreme Court there, the deans of the various law schools, and there was a big discussion about how we can improve access to justice. But one of the things that came up during the course of that meeting was that 25% of the practicing bar today will retire in the next five years. And so, you know, all of those young people who have decided not to go to law school are going to miss an opportunity because they're chasing the puck instead of skating to where the puck's going to be. There's going to be an opportunity. It may not be precisely on the day you graduate, but the world is getting more complex not less complex, and there's a greater need than ever for lawyers. Moreover, 75% of the poor and middle class combined, if you take the, the poor and the middle class, put them together, do not have access to legal services in this country. And you have an opportunity to, to fix that or, or lower that gap and improve on that disparity because you are more technologically advanced than any other generation to come out of law school. When you combine your legal education with your knowledge of technology, there's a way that we can become more efficient and more effective and do great things to serve the public and make sure that those who are underserved have an opportunity to have their legal uh, rights vindicated and protected. It is a great personal privilege for me to introduce Jim Silkenet. Jim is a partner at Sullivan Worcester in New York City, and he heads their international practice. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in the law. Uh, he started out at Cravath after graduating from the University of Chicago Law School, where he was on the law review. Jim has been active in international affairs uh, from the time he first graduated from law school. He's on the Council of Foreign Relations. He was one of the, of the founders of the uh, Committee on International Human Rights, which is now Human Rights First. Uh, he was one of the chairs of the World Justice Project when it was incubated in the American Bar Association. Uh, he's been legal counsel to the World Bank. Uh, he just has done so much in so many varied ways and brings a unique perspective to the American Bar Association and, and, and the legal profession because he reminds us every day that we don't practice in an insular environment. We are all part, it's almost a trite thing to say now, but we're all part of a global economy and a shrinking world. And lawyers who don't recognize that are going to be left behind. And Jim is uniquely qualified to remind us of the importance of thinking more broadly and more globally as we undertake our practice. Jim's written 14 books, more than 100 articles. Uh, he's indefatigable. I, I can't keep up with him. He gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and runs before he catches a 7 a.m. flight out of LaGuardia. And he does that every time he has to fly somewhere. I mean, every morning, rain, sleet, or snow, uh, he gets his exercise, he travels, he works. Um, and on, a, on just a personal note, <coughs> working with him this year has just been a unique privilege because, you know, sometimes you, you're only president for one year, 
And it's very hard to get everything that you want done in 12 months unless you are allowed the freedom to plan and, 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 and put your thoughts together and put your committees together. And Jim said, right out of, right out of the box, he said, there's, there's enough for everybody to do. There's more on our plate than we can possibly do. Go ahead and start your planning. Don't worry about me. I'll be out there working. You do what you need to do, and we'll complement each other. And it's been a real team effort, and I think that's a has given us in the American Bar Association a real opportunity to even expand uh, our scope and our, our breadth. Um, Jim has uh, really focused on a number of issues this year. I won't say a whole lot more because you'll hear from him. Uh, immigration reform has been a, a real issue, and you'll hear a lot more about uh, one idea that he's got that's really getting traction to bridge this justice gap, the legal access job for him. Uh, it's something that people have talked about before, but it took Jim Silk and that to put a team together that's really allowing us to do something about providing opportunities for younger lawyers to help us bridge that justice gap in this country. So it's a privilege for me, it's an honor for me, and I'm so grateful for my friend Jim Silk and that for coming to Columbia, South Carolina to speak to you this evening. Thank you. <laughs> It's really a great pleasure to be back in Columbia. Uh, I have a, a really unique advantage uh, as ADA president, maybe uh, an advantage that, that no other ADA president has had, and that's to have William Hubbard as president-elect of the ADA. Uh, he is a treasure for South Carolina. He is a treasure for the ADA, uh, and it is so great to be able to work with him. Uh, William's one failing, however, uh, is that he actually believes I'm going to give this job up in August. <laughs> uh, and we're going to have to talk about that in great detail later. Uh, in various talks around the country, I always say that American legal education uh, is the best in the world. You've heard that already here tonight. For more than a century, the American legal profession, our law schools, the American Bar Association, state supreme courts, and others have collaborated to create a system of legal education really that is widely admired all around the world. But today it is clear that what we are doing is not enough. There is almost universal agreement that the current system needs to evolve. Legal education in the U.S. must evolve to match the changes that are taking place in legal practice for all of us every day. We must transform the way we prepare law students and young lawyers to match up with the record changes that are taking place in the legal profession. All of us know that what we do today as lawyers uh, differs radically from what we did when we started out. Uh, the issues are different, the procedures are different, the technology is different. Uh, so we've had to evolve and legal education needs to evolve too. Earlier, you listened to the panel uh, on the final report issued by the ABAs task force on the future of legal education. This is an entity that I pushed the ABA to create, and I'm very pleased with the work that they did. It has generated great discussion, uh, some heat, some light, and I, I think it's going to continue to, to motivate people to, to work on the issues they've raised. The report calls on law schools, bar associations, regulators, and others to redesign the educational model now prevalent in law schools, revise the system that accredits law schools permit more experimentation and innovation and expand opportunities for delivery of legal services. So while it's certain that more can be said about the report and will be said, I want to focus my remarks tonight uh, on one particular issue that I have been working on uh, in parallel with the task force's efforts. The American Bar Association has been working to address uh, what we're calling an access to justice paradox. Simply put, we're trying to tackle the tw twin problems of the enormous unmet legal needs across the United States, and at the same time, the large number of young lawyers who are currently underemployed and uh, seeking uh, experience and training. Too many low and moderate income people cannot afford legal representation today, and as a result, they are denied the justice they deserve. Meanwhile, too many recent law school graduates are without good jobs or the practical experience they need to be effective lawyers. So we're at a crossroads. 
How do we address a problem that seems to defy uh, the rules of supply and demand? How do we confront this challenge really to our most cherished principles? Among my first actions as ADA president was to create uh, an ADA legal access document, which is charged with improving the fit between the needs of our profession and the needs of our society. I believe that the ADA, working with state bar associations all around the country, is really in a unique position to address these particular uh, issues. To begin, we are committed to looking at the dearth of legal jobs and the large number of unmet legal needs as one problem. One problem instead of keeping the two issues isolated in, in separate silos. We cannot afford to be a nation where the legal needs of a large portion of our citizenry are not being met in the way that our Constitution requires. According to the Legal Services Corporation, only a small fraction, really less than one in five, of the legal problems experienced by low-income people are addressed by a private attorney or a legal, legal services lawyer. The demand is so great that nationally only one legal aid attorney is available for every 6,400 low-income citizens. In addition, there are significant portions of our country where the lawyer population is scant or non-existent and where the local population, for all practical purposes, does not have timely or proximate access to a lawyer. The New York Times reported in the last year that when a lawyer in Bennett County, South Dakota, retired after 64 years in legal practice, there was not one attorney to take his place. The closest working attorney was more than 120 miles away. So in a country founded on the promise of justice for all, Americans without lawyers are Americans without justice. This means that a single mother living with her children in an apartment with unsafe uh, floors or cockroaches with severe mold will be unable to fight her landlord's illegal eviction attempts. A domestic violence survivor will be unable to obtain a restraining order and gain custody of her children. And an honorably discharged Marine living in a homeless shelter will be unable to access, to access the military benefits that would enable him to get back on his feet. There are many examples of real, monumental life issues that can be alleviated with the help of a lawyer. And there is a pool of newly minted lawyers out there wanting to help. You are all aware, that even with the strength of your wonderful law school here, that young lawyers are looking for work. In 2012, only 56% of nearly 46,000 law school graduates had a job requiring bar passage nine months after graduation. One attorney in California posted an ad on Craigslist that read, quite frankly, I am quite desperate and willing to learn and dedicate myself to any area of the law. The ADA is currently looking at the range of problems, uh, programs now in place, from rural outreach programs and nonprofit fellowships to modest needs programs and incubators that help struggling lawyers meet the legal needs of the underserved. Everything is on the table at the national level, local level, state level. There have been very some very exciting uh, work done in my home state of New York in 2007. The City University of New York launched the first incubator for new practitioners. Today there are 22 such incubators around the country. Additionally, Bob Katzen, the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Judge of the Second Circuit, has launched an immigrant justice corps that will be a model for other programs uh, also around the country. I mentioned South Dakota. South Dakota's Rural Practice Project is an example of an initiative that has grown organically at the state level. Believe it or not, a state legislature was willing to help here. The state legislature and the state bar in South Dakota recently started providing financial incentives to lawyers willing to practice in the state's rural areas. Similar programs have now evolved in a number of states and even in parts of New York State. Uh, there are counties where access to a lawyer really isn't available. As a national association of nearly 400,000 members, the ABA should help coordinate, stimulate, and assist these efforts around the country. Many of the existing solutions to these problems have faced 
challenges in terms of funding and long-term sustainability. We are paying particular attention to that set of issues. And when it comes to financing, we want to make sure that what we are that we are not creating systems that take money away from current programs that we know are already chronically underfunded. The ADA has a long history of advocating for legal aid funding, for pro bono, and many other forms of legal assistance for those in need. Our work in creating and promoting a legal access job or to plug at least a portion of the access to justice gap, and at the same time to help younger lawyers gain needed experience at the beginning of their careers is at the center of what we should be doing as an association. I am deeply interested in you, uh, today's law, uh, law school students, and in your future. And we should all be deeply concerned about the shape of our legal profession uh, in the years ahead. Access to justice is at stake in the choices that we make and the priorities we choose. To practice law properly is to engage in a public service of the highest order. Law is a great profession and it can and does provide a meaningful and inspiring career. As a profession, we will continue to seek pragmatic ways to address today's economic and marketplace realities. Uh, there is a lot of work for us to do. It is important work and I'm eager for all of us to do it together. So what we're going to do now, if the technology works, is we're going to show a short video about our Access to Justice job board, which sort of elaborates on the Access to Justice paradox that I described. And then I'll be happy to answer questions and get your reaction to the, uh, uh, to the issues raised in the video. And we'll see how this works out. <laughs>
Slow it down a little bit. It's, it's so fast that it's hard to absorb. For, for those of us who are not young students. I was going to say, for those of us on a certain day, it's going to be fast, yes. How do you, you see the, uh, the question about the, the cost of money? Obviously, there, these are programs that do cost money in some manner. Uh, one written by law schools, something underwritten by foundations. Do you see this as a combination of sources of, of funding for these types of things? We are, of course, we're, we're looking for the really deep pocket, either a government pocket or a, uh, a philanthropy or, or just some rich person someplace. Um, uh, not having found any of those quite yet, um, what we're looking for now is a combination of resources and to find something that works that makes a difference. Now, we're not going to be able to solve 100% of the access to justice problem. I mean, that's nonsense. But if we can make it have an impact on 15 or 20% of it, that's a huge number of people that we're helping. Um, and I think that that's the direction we will wind up going, pursuing best practices, pursuing regional groupings, uh, regional efforts uh, that it can have an impact on the ground rather than the grand national organization that we would do if we had the money for it. Yes, sir. For almost all these programs, there is a, a salary that goes along with it. It's not a full-time salary, you know, a, uh, what you would make as a, a second or third year associate, but it's, it's a living wage. Uh, and a number of the programs, uh, one of them that we cite uh, very often is the University of Miami Law School program. Uh, after people pass the bar, uh, the, the school will pay them a wage, $50,000, something like that, uh, for the next six months. And of the folks that enter that program, 98% of them at the end of that six months have a full-time job at a full salary, either with that institution or another one, because they've got a skill now that they can sell. They have experience, they can do something. There were mixed in there, and, and admittedly it was a bit quick. There were three or four uh, bar association programs that were listed. Um, we could have cited a range of things. We want to encourage more bar association activity. We want to encourage more law school activity here. Um, it's got to be a combination to make this work because the th same thing doesn't necessarily work in each location. <laughs> Senior lawyers. There you go. Good. Um, you know, there are a lot of retired lawyers or lawyers who are winding down who are doing this kind of thing, too. How does that play into work? The, <clears throat> the focus of this at the beginning was to address the, the, the two silo issues that I mentioned, the lack of access, which is probably the most important, but also training and experience for younger lawyers. So our, our focus at the beginning was younger lawyers because we wanted to address that, that very topical problem now. 
in discussing this around the country, it's obvious that uh, a way to help on the access to justice side is to take advantage of those of us um, moving eventually towards the end of our career uh, and, and use that talent to, to you know, slice a bit of the, the access to ju justice problem off too. I mean, we've only got, what, 25, 30 more years of practice? But, <laughs> right, good. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you this evening.